Let's come back to our market. So this in, in market, uh, is it a double whammy? Now, uh, all, all this depends on uh, what are you prepared for. You know, that's uh, exactly what we have been discussing till now. That uh, uh, what is it that you are trying to do? I mean, uh, the market is really a battleground. But let's not mistake a battle for a war. There is no war. You can't get into a war also, as I said earlier. So uh, when, you, when you are out into the market, you, you must understand that it is a fight. There, there is uh, no quarters given there. And you once you make up your mind that, no, I'll fight it out, you won't find it's that difficult. It's not. It's not that difficult. You have to make up your mind. You, you shouldn't get, you know, like, uh, you know, this guy said this and that fellow never paid me today and all that. He'll pay you tomorrow. As I said, some you win and some you lose. I mean, you, you have to win more and lose less, obviously. Otherwise, you're out of business. It's not a share market. It is a market which you essentially control. You are the person who is controlling the market. Do make no mistake about that. As uh, he said that if you, if you look at the various issues which are involved, whether it's money, whether it's your vendor, whether it is your, uh, your creditors, uh, your debtors, they are all in a relationship mode. You know them. They can be one bad apple. Otherwise, it's, it's nothing that you can't do. It's very much doable. So, you strategize. You know, what I have written in the first part, all of you, I hope, know this. But you must also understand this is the most important part. Whatever you do, whatever we have said earlier, it is your job to see that at no point of time you are in such a situation that you have no money to run the business. So the entire strategy would be that at every point of time you must be flexible enough to see that your business is running. It, it is incumbent to understand that you cannot close down a running business and open it after 8 days, 10 days, 15 days and say that I have cut my losses for 15 days and now from the 16th day I will be again in profit. It does not work like that. So the, the, there, there is no ground rule, there is nothing in the textbook which tells you how can I keep my business afloat and I am going through some trying times. That is where you are the Raja. That is where you really have to be the person who understands the pulse of your business. This is something no textbook can teach you. If textbook had taught, it has been taught across the world, from the topmost to the smallest business school, you know, there will be so many successful industrialists. There aren't. But at the same time, the people who have not gone to schools and they are very successful. So why? Because this is the mantra they know. And this is the mantra you have to learn. Your business must be on. Volumes may be small, doesn't matter. It must be on. You must know how to stay afloat. To stay afloat, you need revenue surplus, not loans. We are talking of bank loans, bank loans and bank loans. Let me tell you, my dear friend, please be very, very careful about taking loans. 
because something which again I am sure all of you know bank charges compound rate of interest you know that how many of you know that the bank charges compound rate of interest. So, even a small loan even a small loan can go to figures which when you see it in the morning you may fall off the chair suddenly you will get a bank statement and you will know I know 60,000 was outstanding and you open the statement and you will fall off the chair it will be an astounding figure. So, revenue surplus should not be something which will be dependent on your bank loan. Revenue surplus is not cash flow. Revenue surplus is actual money that your business is generating. Number two, it is my personal suggestion especially, especially for startups that if you are at all going to take a loan, take a loan which is the basic minimum that you require, basic minimum you scrounge here, you scrounge there everything and then you say no I need still 10 rupees and give it a lot of thought and then go for the 10 rupees. Do not do the reverse, then I will keep the 90 rupees with me and I will go for 90 rupee loan. You are dead if you do that. You, you must understand also that the banking system in India has changed. That if, you, if your business goes down, the bank will not let you go anywhere the bank will be after you forever and ever and ever. So, you go, you, you, you see this entire strategy, if you look at the strategy, the market. So, when you are looking at the market, look at the market and look at costs. You are looking at uh, tie up, look at the tie up, look at, at the cost. You are looking at your product, you look at the product and look at it cost. And you build on that and you work out an analysis which gives you the base cost minimum cut 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 yeah this is the base this is what I am I can do and I do not have this amount of money but I can get say 75 80 percent of this 90 percent chances you will succeed in your business but if you even if you take 50 percent of it as loan nobody knows what is going to happen. In, in today's context, if the bank manager is transferred, things go wrong. Then what in revenue surplus, again what I have written all of you know, but here also you see that uh, things which uh, we assume is something on which we have not spent much time, cost of sales. Now I, I, people who are already in business, please do not answer, those who are not. What to do? What do you understand by cost of sales? Somebody respond. Who is not in business? What do you understand by cost of sales? Like cost of sales can be a distribution cost, uh, having a proper channel of marketing. So this will include includes this cost of sales. Yeah. So what? 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 Uh, do you, can you expand on it a bit? Uh, suppose there is a product. So, if it has to come to the market, then it needs that distribution channel like through retail, wholesaler, then retailer. No, so can you expand on it? I mean, I understand that. Yeah. The, what would be the cost to the company in cost of sales? It means percentage. As no, no, not percentage. What is the, what is the cost? Where is the cost coming? So, you there see, involves uh, people. People. Like who will so, you would say salary would be one. Yeah. Okay, then? Then, uh, Transportation cost. Okay. Then? Advertising, yeah. Advertising cost. Selling and distribution overheads. Advertising cost no. need not be a cost of sale. Cost of freight. Freight commission. would be. Yes, freight. freight commission would be. He is in business. No, I wanted non business people but to taxes, understand this. Taxes, yes. like. Uh, no, taxes is not cost of sales. Like if it is foreign goods? No, no, taxes is not cost of sale. Anything else you think that can come in? Generation, lead conversion, all the costs that you know in Yeah. You understand what you meant by lead generation? Yeah. What, what, what do you understand by lead generation? Like making customers. Yeah. So, for a new company that is a quite a heavy cost, isn't it? Because nobody knows you. 
So, in, in many cases we find that uh, this cost is not properly evaluated. And ultimately, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, uh, say it takes one year for the company to come to uh, volume of sale which is giving him surplus. He has to be very cautious that he does not entail a cumulative loss which subsequent years even after he generates surplus he is unable to pay back. Many companies go down because of that. So this area, the cost of sales area and which I would also add to that is the service support services, cost of sales and support services. So this area has to be very, very well evaluated. Now, I will just give you a very interesting example. See, you are the CEO of a company. So, you go to a good client. You can't go to good client on a bicycle. You have to go in a taxi. So, that is expensive. But you go to a good client. You send a man to a good client. And that man has to just deliver a product or a booklet or something. That man can go on a bicycle. So, you reduce cost. But at the same time, if you have to go, and initially you have to go, initially you can't send somebody. In, at least for a year, probably you can't send somebody else. Then your cost is high. Plus the fact that you are leaving your main business, that is your office or whatever, factory or whatever, and moving out to somebody, someplace else, and that time lost is also your cost. I think we have discussed part of it, but I think this one third point I would like to again uh, emphasize that when you are pricing your product, that is we come back to the word pricing, when you are pricing your product, please remember that your prices should be such that at any point of time, you may be asked to slash your prices to stay in the market. This is very important. And there is always, market always has a cycle. And if this happens, that you have to slash your prices straight in the market, this the entire cycle you have to be there. It is not just one time. It is not one of those Diwali dhamaka offer and all that. It, 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 it is a cycle which you have to be there, sustain for the cycle at those prices. So your revenue part, when you are working out your revenue part, this is another area where lot of thought has to go in. Have, am I clear on this? Have, have you understood this? Yeah, we were talking a while ago about brand, about advertisement. Let, let us understand that if you mean advertisement in newspaper advertisement, it is a strict no, no for a new startup. We do not have the financial muscle to book pace in national newspapers. We don't. Don't try that route. People will say you don't have a brand image. Yes, we don't have a brand image. Brands are never built in a day. Brand takes years to build. Brands are extremely complex issues. You know, a, a, a company, every company would like to have a name which people will say, oh, you are this company, all of us want that. But please remember, it is we who create that, it is a consumer driven. It is we say that I want a Park Avenue shirt. And I, you know, I won't talk of any, any other shirt, but I want a Park Avenue shirt. This is a very complex issue. So, we as startups, we should not at the moment think of brands. We should not at the moment think of putting money in advertisement, however small. In a small advertisement in a, in a Times of India will cost you 25,000 rupees. Small means really small, you need a magnifying glass to see it also. So, you have to sell the paper with a magnifying glass. 
how can you sell? No brand, no fund. You sell as we have already discussed, we are going to the people. Go and talk. Go and meet. Be everywhere. And the biggest factor in your favor is your age. At the age of 25, you have the enthusiasm, you have the energy to run around. And you must run around. Yes. People are your ambassadors. It's people who will be your consumers. It's people who will be your market. And as I said a while ago, you are not targeting 1.10 billion people. You have already segmented. You have gone to geographical areas. You have segmented the geographical areas. And now you go to the people. And, you, and what will happen? You go to the people and more than anything of selling, what will happen? What will happen? There is another thing which will happen which was discussed a while ago. By going to the people, what will happen? Goodwill. So you sell and you create your goodwill. Two things happen. Right? Most of it, what I put here, you know, so we have also discussed it. The one thing which is the last one I want to emphasize on is that please never make a mistake of saying that you are wiser than your customer. The day you do that, you are finished. The day you do that, however stupid that customer is. I, I don't understand anything about your product. And you say, you don't understand, I don't want to sell the product to you. I don't want people like you. You finished. You say that, you finished. Please remember this is the golden rule. You are never wiser than your customer. Your customer is the wisest man and that is what has to be primary in you, in your entire strategy. More than that, we have all the time been talking about who is a customer, who is the OEM market, who is this, who is that, how do I do, bank loan, this, that and the other. At the end of the day, if you see, unless people, that is the people we are talking of, that your client, customer, whoever, unless they believe in you personally, they won't believe in your product. Only it, 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 the, the, your product, your market will only come forth provided they believe in you. So we started by saying, things like goodwill, we started by saying that it is the people, we started by saying that you create goodwill by selling yourself. Why? Because it's you, not your product, not your other features of your product which will ultimately sell. It will sell because of you. This is something which uh, I would share. Surviving the roller coaster. You know, I have uh, spoken about uh, things like market cycle, pruning your cost. But there can be really hard times. Extremely hard times. It's very important to build an alternate line, which I have named it the bread and butter line. This is my name. This is not, you won't find it in a textbook. I call it the bread and butter line. What do you understand? I'm asking the entire audience. What do you understand by this sentence, the bread and butter line? Anybody? Uh, something uh, which is very simple and will be generating revenue despite uh, you not paying much attention to that segment. I'm sorry, sir. It will never work. It will never work. What you said will never work. You need to have this line so that uh, you survive actually. Otherwise, this is your, your baseline. This is where you, your core is running. You're, you have to ensure that this is taken care of properly and this is safe. 
only then you can think of expanding or any other thing. This is the first line on in business. Anybody no, else? Under uh, no circumstance, our personal life should, our other life should get hit just out of business. No, 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 that nobody can promise. <laughs> that I don't think anybody can promise. Anybody else? Any activity that will generate uh, revenue for you, it could be consultancy. No, it could be anything. Could no, no. In your, uh, uh, it, your main business is that of, let us say, manufacturing. And uh, you have a second line where you can just put in your uh, uh, consultancy. As a consultant, you keep on earning. So there, uh, oh, no, uh, there no. you are only using your knowledge and time. Not a bad idea. And, and uh, nothing else. Not a, not a bad idea. And it at least keeps the fire burning. Yeah. Okay. So let me share with you, I mean, two classical cases of bread and butter line. Anybody heard the name of Biorad? Biorad is the world's largest <coughs> and most reputed diagnostic equipment manufacturer and reagent manufacturer located in San Francisco. You can go to their website, they've got a fabulous website. And this is first hand, I went there. Biorad, even today, and it's very interesting, Biorad even today is a family run business, is listed in the New York Stock Exchange, is a family run business. The original founders, I think one, the wife died, I think gentleman is still alive. And he still takes interest in business, but not on a day-to-day -day basis, but he still takes interest. The husband-wife team, they are PhD in biochemistry from Berkeley. And sometime in 1958, around that time, they set up this company in California. And they were manufacturing reagents, not, not uh, any equipment then, reagents. And there were no takers. So after a year and a half or so, they ran out of money. They ran out of money. They, as you know, in the US, you can mortgage your house. They did all that. So they, whatever was done, done, they ran out of money. Then to survive, these two PhDs, they started selling, first designing and then selling greeting cards and toilet paper rolls. For two and a half to three years, they survived on that. It was only after another four years or so, this business broke even. Today it is huge. Any top diagnostic laboratory you go to will have a biorad equipment. The, this is something the, even the smallest member of the organization is aware that how the company survived those times. And they, the, the founders would like people to know this, that this is how they survived. Probably to the best of my knowledge, this company was founded even before HP. And uh, so if you ask me uh, if, if there was a knowledge-based uh, uh, enterprise in California, it was this company, not HP. And, but uh, the fact that they were intelligent enough to identify that line first, identify the segment and survive, <laughs> primarily survive. And when I was hearing this, I was astounded. <clears throat> I mean, let us do a soul searching. We, all of us individually know people in our family and all who are also very highly educated, how many of them would ever think of <laughs> printing or making uh, greeting cards and selling toilet paper rolls? How many of us? And this is what is needed in today's knowledge domain. Your intelligence, your knowledge must create the versatility that you are talking of. What is it you are talking of? You are saying my IT, press a button here and there will be a rocket which is going to the moon. Yeah, that's what you are saying. 
but that is hardware. Your brain, does it say that? Most cases, no. It's not saying that. You are saying, I am dying. I have no money. I have no business. Nobody is buying my product. No. Then you are not in a knowledge driven enterprise. Where is your knowledge? Where is your knowledge? What, what have you done with your knowledge? Ask yourself the question. I am not asking. You ask yourself. What have you done with your knowledge? So this is California, US, land of the plenty, Trini Lopez. Anybody heard of Trini Lopez? No. Anyway. <laughs> the other one is an Indian company. As a matter of fact, I was a part of this company. This was manufacturing one of the finest music systems in the country, Cosmic. We had a, this is the first company in India to have a tie up with a world leader called Akai. Okay. So this company was manufacturing radio sets from 1952. 1952, I was in kindergarten school, so I wasn't here. Subsequent to that, radios went out of fashion. I mean, the big radios, valve ones, went out of fashion. And they uh, didn't know what to do. They were not selling radios. They were selling radios and radiograms. You remember this? Rec Anybody seen radiograms? Record changer would be there, radio would be there, a huge box. It's very uncouth, but it was a big thing those days. Anyway, so they had a good carpentry section. And again, the innovation of the company, they developed a loudspeaker box without nails. Very sturdy. It's not one of those things that will open up and all that. Very, very sturdy. You throw it, also nothing happens. And they got a national award for that. Not for radios, which they're making for so many years, anything, for that nailless box. And they could give excellent finish. The, those days, Formica and all that was not in fashion. So they had some scratch proof, proof finish and all that. And for nearly six, seven years, I'm not very certain about the number of years, they were doing interior design, designing for uh, overseas uh, consulates and things like that. And they survived on this, on woodwork. The companies which subsequent to this was in top class hi-fi stereo manufacturing has a background of carpentry. And they survived those five, six years on carpentry. So this is a very, very Indian case of a bread and butter line. This we have been talking now and again. What is the key, technology or the business? Yeah, OK, can you expand on that combination of the two? What do you mean by combination of the two? <clears throat> like if, we, if it is a product driven one, then R&D should one of the factor. Otherwise, that will not grow up. And that should have a business sense. If that should have? A business sense. Like if you are not selling it to the market, if only it is in prototype form. You know, what, what uh, I, I mean, what she is saying is, is very relevant as a matter of fact, if you really think about the normal discussions we have. You know, what uh, we uh, uh, have a, a, a real uh, problem in front of us is that uh, when we talk of, in today's context, we talk of technology and all that, uh, what is it that we should really be talking about? Should we be talking about technology or should we be talking about the business? I, I, I understand the fact that uh, you are technically qualified, you know technology, but it is true that the business is technology enabled, very true what you are saying. But uh, what is it you are trying to do? Are you trying to fit your concept or your knowledge in technology into the business? or the reverse. And this is a basic question I am asking the entire participant. What is it that we are trying to do? Are we trying to fit 
our individual knowledge of technology into a business. I am not saying it is right wrong, I am just making a statement. Or is it that there is a business and you are trying to find an appropriate technology to enable that business? This is my question. We need actual live examples where you said that the business is ch chasing technology. Can you give an example of that? Sorry? No, I, I don't know the business model of iTunes, so I'm sorry, I cannot. Anybody else knows could probably interact. Business chasing technology could be the office automation thing where you combine scanner, printer, everything together uh, and make a single unit instead of going for four units. No, business, business take no, no, the way I understand it, let my other participants also contribute. The way I understand it, if you say business chasing technology, that means you have uh, rocket science and we are all queued up to buy it, the way I look at it. Anybody would like to elaborate on that? Yeah, we are talking about technology where uh, technology is the primary driver. Exactly. Where it is the source. Yes. Why selling is happening, you know, because yes. if you have the technology. Yeah. I don't think we, uh, none of the entrepreneurs here, including myself, have that kind of technology. So let us be very uh, clear on this that uh, really we do not have that technology which business would be chasing. We do have business which can be enabled by intelligent people like you through your knowledge of technology. That is very much possible. And that is what is the need of the art. Can I give an example? Sure. Uh, while we were incubated here at the IIT Bombay Business Incubator, we were <coughs> developing technology for retail stores. So when I started the company, the focus was primarily enterprise retail. So we said we'll develop this technology, we'll sell it to large retailers. Uh, what we kind of later figured out was that India is a good testing ground to build the products in, but not a revenue market uh, because service personalization wasn't a focus for big retailers. So we, we now had these products, we had customers outside India, but no customers in India. We had pilots with most of the big retailers. We started looking at the Indian market and you know one day we were just sitting and we were doing, we had done some market research and uh, there was a pie chart up there which said 97% Indian market is unorganized retail and 3% is organized. And then suddenly we started thinking that you know hey, this 97% market is the bottom of the pyramid market, very exciting, what do we do? So over the next couple of days we actually went to the market and we kind of figured out that this Kiranawala is kind of very scared. He's a good customer for us, uh, our technology can help him. Uh, survive the onslaught of big retailers, but he can't buy the technology. Okay, and so for big retail, we used to go and pitch that you know we are first in the world technology with patents, and you know IBM can't you know you can't do it using IBM Enterprise Miner, but you can do it using our data mining engine. We said we need to completely shift the focus, and we started pitching the machine as a machine which can make you earn more money. And the focus to the Kiranawala was not talk about anything on the server side, anything on the uh, interfaces that we had innovated. But the pure focus when we went, used to go to the Kiranawala was that you don't invest anything and you earn 3,000 rupees a month. So one key lesson over there was that you know eventually it's the business innovation which will help you succeed in any given market rather than only purely technology innovation. Anybody else? So yeah, you want to say? In terms of business innovation, I just want to share, you know, uh, if a business innovation model can be innovated as we move along the market. Uh, for example, in mobile advertising, I started off with SMS, but then I saw uh, a potential need for M service in India. And it is picking off well for me, you know. That's an innovation out of the business model that was there existing. Then we launched M brochures. Like you have a brochure and you can get it on a... Open. All these are not something I got an idea or I was having them. It's just that model was flexible enough to take the feedback and you know loop it back into that. So it's like a business model driving the technology rather than the technology driving the business. What uh, we are aware is and the sort of ecosystem that we are working in, it is the business which is being enabled by technology as and when. Now, this one example I give which is very true. Any day, any time, a samosa wala will make money. 
he does not have to come to all this workshop and listen to all this rubbish. He will have a karai, he will have a chula, there are people queuing up, having his samosas. It is a business. Why are we here? We are here because we are looking at the knowledge domain. Can we earn as a nation from this knowledge domain? And why must we earn from this nation, from this knowledge domain as a nation? Why? Can, you, can anybody say why? Why must we earn? I mean, I, as you know, uh, I do not want to give figures, but many of the students from IIT go to US. So I think this is an open secret, is nothing. I do not want to give you percentages, but <laughs> I. So, but the ones which are here are here, and the country surely earns out of the person, whether it is in terms of income tax, whether it is in terms of central excise duties out of the uh, activities of yours, sales tax and things like that. So, entrepreneurs do create wealth for the nation. But can anybody say why is it that we are as a developing nation looking at the knowledge domain? Can, can anybody guess? I am not guess. Can you, would anybody like to try on this? Uh, we have a resource constraint in terms of infra infrastructure. This is the only domain the, because of the number of people we have it could be the potential uh, point where we have a billion people, so which means a billion brains, which means so much knowledge uh, domain we can do that. One is that. And the infrastructure cost in other domains, extremely high for us to invest. We do not have the money. The, that is a factual statement. That is correct. <clears throat> but the solution to this is not what we see in the newspapers that we will get funding from overseas. Nobody is going to give us funding. Nobody gives us funding. Uh, unfortunately, the way the newspapers report it, it seems that a lot of money is coming for funding for the infrastructure domain. It, it is not coming. The, the 2004 World Bank report very clearly states that more than 80 percent of the global wealth is with 20 percent of the population. And we, the India, China, you know, the break, BRIC countries, we have the 80 percent of the population with less than 20 percent of the wealth. So, what is the, the way we can have wealth? The way we can have wealth is if we evolve technology into business and if that business is globally acceptable. That is the only way. There is no, nobody is going to give us money. I was giving a lecture to 14 engineering, government engineering colleges or 14 or 10 government engineering college lecturers in Trivandrum. So, I, halfway through my lecture, I just said, are you aware of what is a knowledge driven? We, I said, we are in a knowledge driven economy and everybody was looking at me. So, I turned around and I said, you know what is a knowledge driven economy? They said, no, I do not know what is a knowledge driven economy. So, I, I was already halfway through. I can't start on knowledge driven economy, it will take a long time. So, I, I was thinking what to do now. So, I turned to two people, fortunately one was the dean of the college, the other was a lecturer there. So, I said assume that you are the, uh, the advanced country, developed country and you are the underdeveloped country and you want to start a business or whatever, you need money. From where will you get the money? He points to his dean and he says, he will give me the money. So, I, I told him, is that so? He says, yes. You ask him whether he is going to give money. So, he was not understanding. So, you ask him, he is sitting next to you. So, he asked him, give me the money. He says, no, I will not give you the money. That was a risk I took. But he said, no, I am not going to give you the money. I said, now tell me what will you do. So, this is where we are. This is exactly where we are. It, it is not a story, it is not a hypothesis. This is, as he said, this is a reality. If we want to really progress, it is money we have to generate. And that money we can only generate through knowledge driven enterprise. That is why we are not talking of samosas, 
we are talking of IT and IT enabled services and things of that nature. And also as I said in agriculture, if we can save, you know the percentage of loss in the agriculture sector, even if we can save 50 percent of that, we are surplus. I think we have also gone through this uh, team, team competencies and things like that. I think uh, most of you have a team I suppose, I am sure there must be at least two people. So some of the areas where you can, of your team, you can leverage for a bread and butter line. So this is a, when you are assessing your team, please do not get straight jacketed. Yes, you, you, you do that <coughs> mobile system or the rocket science, fine. But also see that your team competency is versatile enough to start a bread and butter line. Yeah, the reasons why we should have a bread and butter line is it, it's, uh, you know, an organization as classically we know it, people like us who are in business for more than 10 years, once an organization is in a decline, it's next to impossible to hold it up because your good people leave your funds, your good people leave means the funds become even lesser. And then you know it is a cyclic downfall. You see, everything becomes less, 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 one day everything closes. So it is uh, something which uh, will help you if ever, God forbid, you come to such a situation which let me tell you most businesses go through this situation. <laughs> it is not that something which is a hypothesis, most business go through the situation. So, it will help you to ride over it, surely it will help you to ride over it. And even today in the meltdown that you see, you know, a good company is do, trying its level best to retain its people. You know, this is uh, the value for money. Uh, again, I am asking non-business people, what is your understanding for, of value for money? No, are there no other non-business people? Everybody's business here. Anybody else who is a, there is a professor here, yeah, professor. There is a professor, I bet him. He's not here? Yeah. So, so what do you, what do you say professor from, uh, for value for money? How do, how do you define this? Value means uh, along with the basic need or uh, something additional. No, no. The, if you read the sentence, your customer must perceive its value for money. What, what do you understand by the word value for money? So, I think uh, if the customer is investing in some, some sort of products, he should get proper return on in his, uh, his investment. Proper return on his investment is what uh, he uh, uh, wants from uh, uh, the company which is providing the services uh, to him. No, I, I, I accept that point. But you know why I could have used the word proper return for money, but why I said value for money? Your business? Yeah. No, I want somebody from non-business. Sir, so value for money differs for each individual. Okay, give, give an example. Sir, so example is that uh, uh, for middle class the value of money would be something else than the uh, same money would value for a higher class person. I, I have not categorized it in any class. I have just said that your customer, you see, whoever it is, middle class, upper class, lower class, as somebody said, bottom of the pyramid, perceive its value for money. What would you understand by this value for money? The customer should have get a feeling that uh, for the price that he has paid, he is getting more features or more benefits. Can you expand on this? I mean, a bit more. It is very critical. I mean, it, it is critical. It, it is not only in business. These three words are not only in business, it's for a, every aspect of our life. Uh, let us say, uh, I am from a college. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, we have the minimum fees compared to other colleges. And uh, uh, whenever any student gets admitted at our uh, place it's as per the norms. So, uh, the student can at the entry level get a feeling that at the end of uh, four years, she's not only being educated at uh, 
a certain amount, but she is also assured of a job of a salary so and so. Uh, let us say an average salary is as of today 4.5 and at the end of it she gets a, a job in a company which was not visiting us when she joined, but today uh, she is being placed in a company that is offering a salary of 9 lakhs. And so that is more value than what she had bargained for or what she had anticipated. So, are you saying that uh, the uh, student… Uh -huh. uh, tell me if I am understanding it right. Are you saying that a student who goes through uh, the uh, academic program of your college hmm. feels that the time and money spent in your college is value for the money? Hmm. Is that what you are saying? Yeah. Yeah? Some of them correct. do have perceived. So this is correct. This is correct. So, let us understand the three words. Let us understand what it, what they stand for. When, when we, it, there, there, there are times when I hear more than, more than one, many, many times, my incubators come and say that, sir, customer feels that this is too expensive, too this, too that. I, I find it little uh, worrisome because the same youngster when he goes and sees a movie and he says what a waste of money this rubbish movie. But he is not realizing his customer is feeling today the same about his product. It is no different. It is of primary importance that your services, your products must be perceived as value for the money. If it is not, then do something, put it on a boat, put it at Gateway of India and shoot at it or something. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we have products uh, which are dependent on uh, third party vendors or something like that like operators, in my case in mobile applications or whatever, I am largely dependent on the operator. Uh, he does randomly whatever he wants to do based on his uh, reasoning, whatever logic he has. That affects my customer's perceived quality about me. Absolutely my product is the same. There is no change in my product. At that time, perceived quality is becoming lesser, not because of me, because of the service provider in between. What do I do then? Exactly. This is a. Can, can, all right. Now, my businessman friend is here. What does he do now? Come on. What does he do? This is a very good question. Yeah. Uh, he should have a, a short term plan and a long term plan. So, long term plan uh, will be modification in the technology so that, uh, you know, uh, he has to come up with an architecture so that he, these operators, whatever they change, you know. Uh, he should be able to mend it for his customers in a very small duration, let's say one hour or less than that, okay. So that will be the long term plan, okay, redesign of the architecture. And uh, short term plan uh, would be, uh, you know, list down uh, what all possibilities are there, you know, uh, what an operator can change, okay, and how that affects uh, his customers, okay, and uh, whenever that thing happens, you know, uh, what is his average time to patch up that, okay, so, uh, you know, and uh, communicate that thing to the customer, that uh, so-and-so thing happens, and, you know, this is the average time for us to fix up this thing, okay, so, yeah, even, like, uh, for customer, uh, you know, you are uh, adding a value that, you uh, means if suppose something happens, I ha uh, he is giving me an assurity that this will be fixed in so-and-so time, okay. And uh, also, you know, uh, you'll have to um, f formalize uh, something, some, some kind of protocol between customer, like if you have so-and-so problem, uh, you know, uh, report to so-and-so person so that uh, it will be fixed in this much uh, period of time that uh, he can do. Yeah, before I come to you, Anil, uh, I want to ask you one thing, what he said. Do you think it is a, a reasonable thing to say that over a period of time you can change the architecture of your technology and take it up? And no, just say yes or no. I'll come back to you later. Anil. Yeah, in an integrated environment, when you're trying to deliver service in any manner, it's important to manage your partners. 
Right? You, you need to have an SLA in place with your partners, which you can extend to your customer. The customer is ha unhappy with you because there is a loss of business for him because of what happened. Right? Who is responsible in this game? It, it is the partner network who didn't own up to his accountability and didn't give you what was promised. So if you blame the operator and don't compensate your customer, the loser is you. The customer is going to walk away from you. So it, it is an issue of managing your channel, how we are talking about in marketing, I go and manage my channel. Even in my delivery, I need to manage my channels. There will be a lot of people who come along the way when you're trying to deliver a service. You need to have a relationship and an SLA with these people to make sure you can go and demand the same quality of service because you're a customer for him. Even though he's a conduit, he may be big, but you still need to adhere to some level of quality which you need for you to perform. Uh, I think uh, that also uh, the same thing I wanted to say. I think you have a relook at your business plan because uh, your parameters, see you are working in an environment which you cannot change. You, your environment is you walk out to IIT gate and you may get knocked down by a bus. So <clears throat> that's the environment. So you don't walk out of the IIT gate without seeing whether the bus is coming or not. So let, let's have a relook at your business plan. Okay. Now, let us uh, understand the three final issues the way I see it. The market is so broad based, I mean it is uh, uh, nice to hear people say, oh that is a Tata company and this is a Maruti company and all that. but. Uh, there are times when Marutis are not sold, then uh, thousands of workers and their vendors and all have sleepless night. That is how tough a market is. It, it, it levels you off. It, it is not, the market is not awed at all by Tata, Bata and anybody else. Not awed. So, as you know, I have been hearing my friends talking about I am a startup and nobody knows me. I don't, I, I, you know, how do I generate goodwill? It is applicable to all. Don't think because a company has a brand name, so irrespective, his products are sold. His products are not sold. If products are not sold, then people, thousands of people stand to lose their livelihood. Thousands. So that is how tough the market it market is, and that the positive note here is, it is equally tough on the biggest. It will be equally tough on you. So your entry to the market is on equal footing. It is the way you enter the market. It is for you to look into the issues we have gone through. All the issues, I am sure, is not going to apply to every individual. But most of them are very generic in terms. You will find them of use. It definitely rewards the honest. In 38 years I am in business, I can tell you that. It definitely rewards the honest. You do honest business. People would know you. You don't. Have, you won't have sleepless nights. Absolutely. You see that your customer gets the value for money, as we have discussed, and you won't get sleepless nights. At the same time, you know, I'll I'll give you a small little test case. In in your wherever you live, just see how many new shops open and after how many months or years you will find them closed again. <laughs> just, just do it as a hobby. You will find quite a few. And most of them will say, no, no, I was initially handling this product. I am renovating my showroom. I am doing something else. He is not renovating a showroom. He is giving the showroom to somebody else. And if somebody else is renovating a showroom, 
and some other business will come there. So that is how tough the business is. At the same time, you will find in most places, I, I can't say 100 percent, your neighborhood Panwala is probably there for donkey's years. No computer, no IT, nothing. And uh, IMC did a, a, a study on them. It seems that they do something like 130 item inventory, that one man. Amazing. But the fact is, because he is amazing, he is surviving. And people like you, with this knowledge from some of the finest institutions in the country, we expect the same from you, that you will do amazing things. So after this, I just say thank you. <laughs>